Fan 10 is explaining stories taking place around the world, and I'm your tour guide, Carl Azus. Great to have you aboard. The war-torn nation of Afghanistan is where we start. Despite an effort by a U.S.-led coalition to topple the nation's former rulers, a terrorist group known as the Taliban, they continue to pose a major challenge for the Afghan government. And the ISIS terrorist group, which also operates in Afghanistan, is making conditions even more complicated and deadly. This month, more than 150 people have been killed in the Middle Eastern country, the majority of them in attacks over the last nine days. An assault on a military base in the capital of Kabul left 11 dead yesterday. An ambulance filled with explosives killed more than 100 people over the weekend. Attacks on a charity group named Save the Children and on people staying at a hotel in Kabul are among those that killed dozens more. The Taliban said it was behind two of these assaults while ISIS claimed the rest. And reporters there say residents are increasingly afraid that the Afghan government can't protect them. The country is holding a national day of prayer on Tuesday. The U.S. has had troops in Afghanistan since it went to war there in 2001. There are at least 11,000 American servicemen and women there now, possibly more. Regardless of where they're stationed around the world, a fitness tracking application could be posting their movements publicly for anyone to see. And that could be a serious security problem. It starts innocently enough. A few U.S. troops use an app to track their morning run, how far they go, how long it takes. They're supposed to be trained on how to turn on the privacy settings on their smartphone or watch, but they don't. And suddenly their route, which might include sensitive information about their base, for instance, is public. The U.S. Central Command says it's changing its privacy policies after this happens. Personnel movements on remote military bases revealed by an exercise app. You may have heard of Strava. It's a social network for athletes, and they've actually published a map that shows what everybody who's using their app, who hasn't set their information to be private, is doing, where they're going. And one person realized that this could actually show many people what military members are doing around or even on their bases. If you take a look at these maps, we already knew where the military bases were, if you look at Google Maps, but this tells you something much more intimate, exactly where people are going inside those bases and maybe even where they're going to run around those bases, possibly providing people with very important information. Now, nobody here is alleging that somebody has actually been harmed as a result of publishing this data. But take a look at what a spokesperson for the Department of Defense told CNN, quote, DOD takes matters like these very seriously and is reviewing the situation to determine if any additional training or guidance is required and if any additional policy must be developed to ensure the continued safety of Department of Defense personnel at home and abroad. Strava says they have tens of millions of users and they track cell phones, GPS devices and other fitness tracking apps, but that you can't actually figure out what one single person is doing here or who they are. Quote, our global heat map represents an aggregated and anonymized view of over a billion activities uploaded to our platform. It excludes activities that have been marked as private and user defined privacy zones. But what this all shows is that even members of military bases in remote places aren't always cognizant of the privacy settings, especially when so many apps are set to automatically share information that may be seemingly harmless, but when put together in a large group and published online for the world to see, could pose major operational security risks. A controversial study has come to light that involved animal testing of car exhausts. It was carried out in 2014 at a research lab in New Mexico. It was paid for by three German car makers, BMW, Daimler, and Volkswagen. And what the study tried to do was prove that newer diesel engines were cleaner than old ones. But it was how the study was done that's getting so much attention. As first reported in the New York Times, diesel fumes from a Volkswagen were pushed into airtight containers where monkeys breathed in the fumes. This was done for hours at a time. The three car makers involved confirmed that researchers they hired did the study, but Volkswagen says it was not finished or published. And the research lab says the study won't be published in the future because it was tainted. For years, Volkswagen had been cheating on its diesel emissions tests. It was making its car exhaust seem cleaner in the tests 
than it actually was from its cars on the road. VW admitted to this in 2015. The company says it believes the methods used in the study on monkeys were wrong and that it would have been better not to do it at all. Daimler says it's doing an investigation and the German government says the tests can't be justified in any way. In Germany, using apes as lab animals is mostly illegal, but it is allowed more extensively in the U.S. Tests that involved breathing car pollutants were also reportedly carried out on humans, and those were done at a facility in Germany. 10 second trivia. Of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the only one that's still standing is located in what country? Iraq, Egypt, Greece, or Turkey? Only one of the seven wonders that remains is the Great Pyramid of Giza, and that's located in Egypt. Just one of the priceless archaeological relics of the ancient country. Egyptian engineers recently moved another example, a statue about 1,300 feet from a storage area to a museum in the Egyptian capital of Cairo. Doing that cost more than three quarters of a million dollars. Why? because the statue weighs 80 tons, half the estimated weight of a blue whale, and it's more than 3,000 years old. It's hoped to help bring tourists back to Egypt, a nation that has struggled with numerous terrorist attacks in recent years. An 83-ton statue of Ramses II, considered one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers, has been moved to a new home. Escorted by a marching band, a mounted military guard, and much fanfare, the 3,200-year-old granite statue was transported 400 meters in a specially built cage to the Grand Egyptian Museum. Ramses II, also known as Ramses the Great, ruled ancient Egypt from 1279 to 1213 BC. He is known for conquering large areas of Nubia in what is now Sudan and Syria, and for building on a colossal scale. This is the fourth and thought to be final move the statue has made in its long history. It was moved once in the 13th century BC and not again till 1954, when Egypt's president ordered that it be brought to Cairo. It stood outside Cairo's main train station until 2006, when the government moved it to a temporary location in Giza, fearing that auto emissions were damaging the granite. Its new home is Egypt's massive Grand Egyptian Museum, a 650,000 square foot facility that is still under construction. The museum is intended to reignite the country's tourism sector, damaged by years of violent instability. Ramses now stands at the entrance to the museum, waiting to welcome tourists through its doors. During basketball season, you hear a lot of stories about buzzer beaters and half-court shots, and here's another one. It's not from half-court, though. It's from the free-throw line at the other side of the court. A freshman hurls it and sinks it. It's almost sad that this was worth only three points, but that's all that was needed for Evanston Township High School in Illinois to win the game with a final of 45-44. to how could a buzzer beater better beat a buzzer than with a heave-ho free throw for three, though, that spanned the court of court to court, a game-winning, claim-winning, fame-winning shot for the super-fresh freshman who sank the shot. I'm Carl Azus. Join us again tomorrow for coverage of the U.S. President's State of the Union Address and the opposing party's response. That's Wednesday on CNN 10.